Breaking tonight, a big story involving Hillary Clinton and a powerful businessman who was funneling millions in donations to her family foundation while possibly violating the U.S. sanctions on Iran. Sanctions Mrs. Clinton was supposed to enforce. Welcome to The Kelly File, everyone. I'm Megyn Kelly. There are serious new questions tonight involving Hillary Clinton and the man seen here, Victor Pinchuk. Mr. Pinchuk is the fourth richest man in Ukraine, the owner of a massive pipeline company, and reportedly the man who gave more to the Clinton's family foundation than any other individual. A report now released by Newsweek magazine alleges that Mr. Pinchuk's company may have violated U.S. sanctions on Iran, done business with Iran in 2012 and possibly beyond that year, by delivering nearly $2 million worth of steel pipes to Iran for pipelines. That's a no-no. Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State at that time and happened to be the person charged with holding foreign entities responsible for violating U.S. sanctions on Iran. During that same time, between 2009 and 2013, the Clinton Foundation received at least $8.6 million from the Victor Pinchuk Foundation, and Pinchuk has pledged more than $20 million more and hasn't been charged with violating U.S. sanctions on Iran. We have a big lineup tonight on this. Howie Kurtz is here on the media's handling of this story. It's been ignored entirely. Chris Dyerwalt on the possible political fallout from Mrs. Clinton. And the Wall Street Journal's Brett Stevens is here. But we begin with Trace Gallagher, who has more on Mr. Pinchuk and the story. Trace? And Megan, make no mistake, the Interpipe Group is a major global player when it comes to manufacturing steel pipes, including those used in gas and oil distribution. The company, as you said, owned by 54-year-old Viktor Pinchuk, the fourth richest man in Ukraine, the largest individual donor to the Clinton Foundation. Pinchuk has known the Clintons for nine years and has reportedly become very close friends with Bill Clinton. Viktor Pinchuk is also the son-in-law of a former Ukrainian president who the New York Times says was accused of corruption and murdering journalists. The former president also sold a state-owned steel company to his son-in-law for what critics say was pennies on the dollar. Now, back in November, former Congressman Republican Steve Stockman raised a red flag with the U.S. Treasury Department over Interpipe's dealings with Iran. Stockman was concerned that Interpipe was circumventing U.S. sanctions that prohibit any single invoice of more than a million dollars to Iran's oil and gas industry. Newsweek now claims it has documentation that confirms a series of shipments from Interpipe to Iran Iran in 2011 and 2012 with invoices totaling millions of dollars. Now, some argue that U.S. sanction laws are not well defined and that Interpipe may not be in violation, but Interpipe also has a subsidiary right here in the U.S., and that alone might qualify the company for crippling penalties like denying it access to both the U.S. market and U.S. banks. Back in 2012, a Chinese oil company with no U.S. base of operations was penalized for ignoring U.S. foreign policy. Of course, the State Department is in charge of policing the list of foreign companies, and at the time, the head of the State Department was, of course, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Interpipe has responded to Newsweek's story, calling it inaccurate and potentially libelous saying, quoting here, Interpipe has complied with the sanctions to the letter. Any allegation to the contrary is completely wrong. The alleged evidence of alleged violations is either falsified or the authors have been misled in the interpretation. Experts say violation or not, this is why even some Clinton supporters believe taking donations from foreign companies is a bad idea. Megan. Trace, thank you. Joining us now with more, Brett Stevens, a columnist for the Wall Street Journal, journal and author of America in Retreat, The New Isolationism and the Coming Global Disorder. Brett, good to see you. Yeah. Uh, so this is a significant story uh, that right now is on Newsweek. They posted it on Saturday. And this is as close as we've seen so far to a direct suggestion of a this for that deal, where this guy made millions in donations to the Clinton Foundation, and according to this former congressman, and according to Newsweek, which claims to have seen the documents, he was, he was providing oil supplies basically to Iran, which is a no-no under U.S. sanctions, and faced no penalty, which he denies, but Newsweek and this former congressman seem to think he did. Well, look, this is 
to me, this is just an emblematic story about the way the Clintons do business, the way they've done business for a long time since their days in Arkansas, all the way into the present. Look, if, if Hillary Clinton has a theme song for her campaign, it should be Blurred Lines. Because here we see a perfect example of the blurring of her functions as Secretary of State, as a political figure, as a person with responsibility over a major uh, philanthropy, and then in terms of her private interests. I was at a conference in Ukraine just a couple of years ago, sponsored by Mr. Uh, by, uh, by Mr. Pinchuk, and who, of course, was were the star guests, the guests of honor, Bill and Hillary uh, Clinton. Hillary Clinton. Gave They're very tight. He, the, Bill Clinton was is among his close friends. He, Bill uh, Clinton, went to his birthday party, his 55th birthday party. His, I think it was his 50th he, birthday he when, he, when he flew in Cirque du Soleil into uh, into a town. In that's France. that's nothing. I did that for my last birthday too. But uh, and he and then he went to Bill Clinton's 65th birthday party. I mean, they're tight, and they're and. They're and this guy's given so much money, millions of dollars, and I think 65% of the millions that he's given was given to the Clinton Foundation during the years that Hillary was Secretary of State, which raises, it just underscores the problems that she is going to face if we have a diligent press corps in taking a hard look at what she did or didn't do for those companies while she was secretary. Right, and I think that it's going to be very difficult to prove anything one way or the other. It is true that sanctions laws can often be uh, very, uh, very imprecisely drawn. It's not clear precisely what's under sanction. But it gets to the point that the Clintons inhabit this area between outright corruption and actual ethical conduct, and that's the, that's the world of sleaze. That's the world of connections. That's the world in which people have access to the Clintons or are somehow buying access to the Clintons. I mean, to give you an example, the New York Times last year took note that Chelsea Clinton gets about 75000 or as much as $75,000 a speech for speaking on subjects like diarrhea, which is a subject she, she says she's passionate about. Well, now, in the third why, world, she's why, talking about kids dying I, from... No, I, I understand that, but why do people pay that kind of money? Why do people want the Clintons at their... Uh, at, it's not just to meet Chelsea Clinton? I suspect it's not to learn more about diarrhea as a scourge in the third world. It's, it's to have access and to be able, and that's what this guy has with Bill Clinton. I mean, just sitting next to him gives him legitimacy. Right, and even if the, Clinton, even if the behavior of the Clintons is, is above board, you have to ask, well, who else then has access? Who's invited to the party? What favors are being done by saying, come to a certain conference where Bill and Hillary Clinton are going to, going to be present? And that's why this whole philanthropic sort of uh, empire that the, that the Clintons have assembled between the Foundation, Global Initiative, and so on, I think is, is so toxic and tells you so much about the way the, the way the Clintons have always operated. If you if you like what you're seeing now, we're going to hear about it more and more throughout the campaign and if she's elected through her presidency. And the question remains, to whom does she owe favors because of the Clinton Foundation? Brett, good to see you. Good to be here. Joining us now with more, Fox News Digital Politics Editor Chris Steyerwalt. So how bad, if at all, is this? Well, look, uh... Perhaps it is true that Pinchuk and others uh, who have uh, unsavory associations uh, or these people who are not exactly the kind of folks that Mr. and Mrs. America want to see hanging around with their future president, maybe these people are all fools. Maybe they give all this money for nothing. Maybe they, instead of giving it to the Red Cross or some other charitable place, they give it to the Clintons uh, in hopes of access and they never get any. But that's billions of dollars worth of mistakes that people have been making over the years. Mm -hmm. And for Hillary Clinton, here's the deal. Uh, we remember, you remember Mark Rich? Uh, you me remember what he was in trouble for? He got a pardon from Bill Clinton in, in the flurry of activity at the closing days of the Clinton presidency. He got a pardon because he was uh, on the lam in Europe for violating rules for trading with Iran. It was so serious that he was, via he was trafficking in oil with them that it was so serious he was facing enormous penalties big enough that he fled to Europe and stayed there and then somehow magically at the end of the Clinton presidency got a a very nice pardon deal. Mm -hmm. A deal so, pushed by Eric Holder. Uh, well, yes, a, a deal ratified. Eric Holder checked off on it at the end, uh, which I'm sure he has regretted to this day. Uh, the deal for the Clintons politically on this is, as Brett said, as you point out, the baggage builds up over time, and people just get to the point where you throw up your hands and you say, can we please stop with the one after the next after the other and the long list of association? It accretes to them, and people become fatigued by thinking about, as you say, is this really what you want to live through for the next 
eight years. Well, what about the fact that, you know, if, if this in fact happened, I mean, right, if Newsweek is right and this former Congressman Stockman is right, that the Clinton Foundation took the money and did not enforce the sanctions law against the guy who donated the money, um, because, I mean, the guy who was, you know, giving money to Iran also gave money to, or, you know, selling to Iran also gave money to the Clintons. And if they're right that Mrs. Clinton looked the other way because he was making the donations to her foundation, the Democrats are not going to be happy. I mean, aside from the ethical issues, that's a direct undermining of President Obama's policies, the sanctions he put in place, helped put in place. And that's the key. This is not a story about uh, Republicans don't like Hillary Clinton and here they go again. This is Hillary Clinton undermining what is the cornerstone foreign policy initiative of President Obama. That's the allegation against her. That's the claim in this Newsweek article is that Hillary Clinton was uh, either by inference or action, if you want to take the claim to the next level, uh, inference or action uh, undermining the president's policy on Iran uh, and making the situation weaker. This does not sound like a good time to throw into question how well the sanctions were enforced, just as the president's trying to get them lifted, saying that they've been effective and they worked. Mm -hmm. Chris, it's good to see you. I want to uh, underscore to the viewers again, as Trace reported, that this company, Interpipe, Pinchuk's company, again comes out and says this Newsweek report is inaccurate. They say it's potentially libelous, although Newsweek reported that when they reached out to uh, Interpipe for comment, uh, they did not respond to requests for comment on it. Now, after the fact, after it comes out, they come out and say, we haven't violated the sanctions and this is a potentially libelous piece. We'll continue to follow up on this. We ourselves are searching for the underlying documentation and hope to have a follow-up report for you on this tomorrow night. Well, Newsweek first reported this story four days ago, so why are we just seeing the details on this now? Do you think if this kind of report hit in a publication like Newsweek about a Republican, it would have been totally ignored for four days? Howie Kurtz is next on how the media is handling this one and why. Plus, big news tonight.